So the Mimer told us that that the festival of Sukkot actually has three special mitzvahs that each express the same idea in in different levels. We sit in the sukkah, we shake the luluf, and we bring a sacrifice, oxen, bulls, 70, and in correspondence to the 70 nations of the world. And all the three of these ideas really are one, because they're all about unity, uniting. There's the uni- unity of the sukkah, in which everyone, all the Jewish people should be in one sukkah, because all the Jewish people are the same. Then there's the unity of the lulav, where the Jewish people are not all the same. They're all different. There are four categories of Jews, but they come together as one. So sukkah is unity be'etzem, essential unity, where everyone's the same. There's, there's the, a simple point, the Jewish point, the spark of, of, of the, the divine within the Jewish soul that's the same in everyone, so we're all one. That's the sukkah. Then there's the lulav where actually we're all different. We're on different levels. Some people are very learned, some people not. Some people do a lot of mitzvahs, some people not. However, we're one nation nevertheless. We're four different categories that, that are united, brought together. That's not unity, essential unity. That's unity that comes from multiplicity. Then there's a step even further than that, and that is the 70 bulls representing the 70 nations of the world. That even the nations of the world, which are not Jewish, are not a part of the unity of the Jewish people. Even they are united under the same God, brought, brought under, uh, under holiness, um, add, uh, added on to the cause, to the point where on Sukkot we say halal every day, complete halal, because the 70 bulls that are brought, there are new sacrifices every day. And in halal we say, halu es Hashem kol goyim, shabchu kol ha'omim, that, that all the nations should praise Hashem, in other words, the entire world, including the non-Jews, are united in serving Hashem. And why are they, ser- why, why are they ser- praising Hashem? Because of Hashem's great chesed towards us. That the non-Jewish people, the, the entire world, recogni- should recognize that Hashem's special connection with us is a blessing for them as well. That's unity in the entire creation. Now we're going to Dalit. The idea that the non-Jewish nations should praise and thank Hashem because His kindness has been bestowed upon us, the Jewish people, that is a very high thing. That's a, that's a huge revelation. When, when non-Jewish nations praise Hashem for the kindness to the Jewish people, that's an amazing thing. Um, like after the Six Day War, that such a thing happened. The United Nations uh, were like praiseworthy of Israel and, and the the, uh, the achievement of the Jewish people. It was quite an amazing thing. Nations of the world were were recognizing the blessing that Hashem had bestowed upon us. That's that's a big thing to happen. In fact, in a way. The fact that non-Jewish nations praise Hashem for the kindness He does to us is even greater than the kindness He does to us itself. Th- that's an even bigger deal. For Hashem to do kindness to us is one thing. But for the non-Jewish nations to recognize it and praise Hashem for it is an even bigger deal than the blessing He gave us in the first place. Why? Why is it such an amazing thing? Why is it such a big deal? All it is is them recognizing the reality that, that Hashem has bestowed His goodness upon the Jewish people. Why is that even bigger than the fact that Hashem bestowed His goodness upon us in the first place? Because by the non-Jewish people recognizing the special relationship that we have with Hashem, that fulfills the very purpose of creation. Hashem created the world in the first place that, there should, that He should have a dwelling place in the lowest world, a place that there's no lower place than it. And how is that fulfilled? What does it mean that Hashem should have a dwelling place in the lowly world? It means that the lowly world, in its definition as a lowly world, in its physical state, as it is, should recognize Hashem's power. What better illustration of that 
is there than when the nations of the world, all the nations of the world, including the nations of the world that oppose the Jewish people and uh, oppose God, come to recognize God and, and his relationship with the Jewish people. That is the Yom Tov that, That's a, the best example that Hashem has made his mark on the world. He's been welcomed into the world. Even the non-Jewish nations, even those who are far from, from Torah, are praising him. That's the Rebbe Taftonim. Didn't that kind of happen at Yitzhia Israel? Yeah, all the, the nations were, were in fear and in awe, and yes, yeah, it did. So the, they praise it. It's a new concept. For me, it's very new, because I always thought it was like the, the mission was for us to transform our Neshama Ben-Mit. And here it's saying that it is even lower than that. That's, that's like, yeah. I mean, the... There's Nefesh Bahamas, then there's the Guf, then there's the world, and including the nations of the world. So, so there's, it, it's, what Dirba Taftoni means is that godliness should become normal. So they didn't get, in this get world. the Torah. Holiness, the divine, the divine reality should be normal in this world. How, how, how do you gauge that? Not by the fact that Jewish people are, are serving Hashem. We have, we have enough shalakis. It's, it's that non-Jewish people are recognizing God, even though they didn't receive the Torah. They don't have the divine soul, and yet they are recognizing God, our God, the, and the, the God of the Jewish people, and the fact that the Jewish people have received that, when, when non-Jewish people recognize that, that means the world is getting it. But that's saying that's that the, but that's saying that the nations of the world, the, the whole creation, the whole purpose of creation and the mission is for the nations of the world. Not, not, not the just Jews. them, the entire world. It's like a, I mean, it's a new, they're a part of the world. They're, they're a part of the world that needs to be elevated. What's the litmus test that the world is getting it? Stronger evidence. Mm -hmm. is, is if, if in, in the, the non-Jewish world, this has become the norm to talk about God. That's, that's the test. That's the elevation of this world. The lowest possible world is becoming divinely sensitive. Through, through the Jewish faith. Yeah. yeah. But so you know how, you can talk about later, but we, we don't try to convert or anything like that. So out of the two ideas. So we don't, we don't, want, we don't want the non-Jewish nations to become Jewish, but to recognize the truth of Torah and, and the, the special position that the Jewish people have in bringing God into the world and living a moral life. The seven Noachad laws, yeah, yeah. but, but, but the seven Noachad laws as they are in the Torah. Right. Rambam writes that if a non-Jew keeps the seven Noachad laws, but not because it says it in the Torah, because it says it in their books or because they've figured it out themselves, it's okay, but it's not fully keeping the laws. The real way to keep those laws is because it says in the Torah. So for them to recognize that the Torah is the source of morality and, and has a message for them as well. That's, that's a good thing. But how like people like China would recognize something like that? <laughs> in time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> what about the Swahili? Yeah, well, well, the world can change very, very quickly. These days. Now, the Rebbe brings a, an interesting support for this idea. There's a mimer that starts with Baruch Tiyam that you, you'll be blessed by all the nations. This is a mimer that was said by the Rebbe Marash, whose yard site, this mimer was said on his yard site, Yud Gimel Tishrei. The Isabi Rishalmi. In the in the Talmud Yerushalmi it says, "Im goy ana achrab amen." If a non-Jew blesses you, say amen. Say amen. Answer amen after him. Shenemar baruch tiyem kolamim because the Torah says that you will be blessed by all the nations. So, hmm. so even a non-Jew who blesses you gives you a blessing. Don't reject that. Or, you know, who is he to bless me? No, the Torah gives gives the right that a non-Jew can bless you, and so if a non-Jew blesses you, you should say Amen after his blessing. That's what the Talmud Yerushalmi says. Or maybe by Maimer, the Reb Marash quotes in his Maimer, the Issa Bekisva Arizal, an idea written by the Arizal. One of the thoughts of Rabbi Yitzchak Glory, the Arizal. That the word Amen, that we say after a blessing, Amen, is the unification of two divine names. Mm -hmm. The divine name Yudke Vavke, Havaya, 
and the, for the divine name Adnei Aleph Dalad Nun Yud. Why is why is it a unification of these two names? Because Amen has the same numerical value as those two names. Together, yes, Amen is 91, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, which is 20, 20, 20, 20, which is 26 plus 65. Those two, two, two names together as one. So the idea, the idea of, of a gematria is that, that the numerical value is the same. If these two words connect to that word. So therefore this word is the conglomeration, the unification of those two. Amen is the union of Havaya and Adnei, of those two names. What does that mean? I mean, Arizal writes that, and that means that whenever we say Amen, we are uniting these two powers, two expressions of the divine, Yud Kevavke and Adnei. What does that actually mean? The Indian rule that is this. Davai Hushema Etzel. Atzmus Aaron Sov Shalom Olamas. The name Yud Kevavke is the name of Hashem's self, meaning the essence of Hashem that is above the world. When we, when we talk about Yudke Vavke, that is Hashem as He's beyond creation. Not, not as He interacts with creation, not as He limits Himself for creation, as He is beyond and above creation. Ho Yehovah Yeh, He was, is, and always will be. He's above time, above space, above any limitation whatsoever. That's what Yudke Vavke denotes. But Vishem Adne, but the name Adne, who Kamayim Razal, the Chana, Likres Adne, should after Adon the Chalbri Yosecha. Is like it says in the in the in Medrash that it's appropriate to call you with the name Adne because Adne comes from Adon, the master, and you are the master of all creation. What does that mean? That the name Adne refers to Hashem as His master of creation, as He relates to creation. To call Hashem master of the universe is not really talking about His self. Hashem's self is way beyond the universe. Master of the universe is a limitation of Hashem, that he is interacting and uh, relating to the universe. That's Hashem's light as it is constricted and limited, as he condescends to relate to the world. That's Adne, the master of the world. We look at a master as being exalted. From Hashem's perspective, to be master, he had to lower himself to, to be a master, because he's beyond the universe. Yud Kevavke is talking about him himself that is beyond the universe. Adne is talking about him as he's lowered himself to be a master of the universe to relate to the world. Bottom line, apart from the fact that it says in Chassidus that the name Adne denotes Hashem as he enclosed in the sphere of Malchus, kingship, the lowest of the spheres. De Malchus is Sherish Nivraim, and Malchus is the level of godliness that is the source of of creations, of created beings, as opposed to above Malchus, which is the divine reality that's above, that's beyond. Malchus is the level of Hashem that relates to that which is below. Mm-hmm. In a, the next page, the fact that we, what we quoted, the sages say that master of the universe means the master over all of your creatures, your creatures, it implies that the name Adne is not just the source of all of creation, it's even the source and it even relates to those levels of creation that can only be described as creatures. There's nothing else about them that, that you can say. There's no other advantage that you can describe them other than they were created by God. Meaning the lowest of all creatures also relates to the level Adne. So while Havaya is Hashem as he's beyond all of creation, Adne is Hashem as he relates to all of creation, including the lowest creatures, the simplest and most distant creatures. They're all related to Adne. Abraham Avinu is the first one who called Hashem Adon, yeah? Yeah, I think so. So what does it mean to unite these two things? Havaya and Adne. It means that in Adne should shine Havaya. In the divine light that connects to the world, that is within the world, there should be a shining of the divine light that is beyond the world, that surpasses and, and transcends the world. What would happen then? What happens if you unite these two powers? So that creates 
a reality within creation, including those creations that are the furthest and lowliest and simplest of all creations, they also experience the light of Hashem that's beyond entering into the, right. the world that's within. Shemer behem gili atzbis are in social that they should receive a revelation of the essence of Hashem that is beyond the world, within the world. Which that is a, making a home for Hashem Himself in this world. Because making a, shem, a home for Hashem means for His very self. As discussed elsewhere, the idea of a home for Hashem in this world means two things. A home in this world. A home means that Hashem's very self can be there. That's what a home means. A home is where you can be yourself. In this world means in this world as it is. Not, not changing the world to be some other world. The world as it is, a limited, physical, lowly world, should be a home for Hashem's very self. The highest of realities should dwell in the lowest of realities. That's what Dirabat Akhtoni means. That is achieved by uniting Havaya and Adne. By taking Hashem's self and drawing it down into the, the light that fills the world. So the world experiences Hashem as He is up there. So, meaning the world always has a divine light in it. For the world to exist, it must have divine light in it. It, it has to. It can't exist on its own. The, Hashem is the source of all reality, of all existence, of all, of all um, creation. So there's constantly divine light in the world. The fact that the world exists means there's divine light in it, energizing it and giving it life. But that divine light is Adne, is the divine light that has been contracted and constricted and concealed in order to maintain a world when, and not overwhelm it. That's Adne. Dira means that it's not enough that there's a divine light in the world that maintains it in a hidden way, but the divine light that is beyond the world has to come into the world in a revealed way but and leave the world intact. Not, not overwhelm it, not, not explode the world, but to come into the world in a, in a way that's comfortable. So that, what does that mean? We have to achieve that Havaya should come into Adne, a, a unification of Hashem as He is beyond the world, with Hashem as He is in the world. So the world is maintained, but it's a home for Hashem. Hashem's very self is revealed in it. That's what Dirab Tachtonim means. So... So how, how does that connect with the word Amen that we said? So it explains the third line in Goy Amen. That's what it means. If a non Jew blesses you, say Amen. Why? Do you throw Because the Jewish people, our source is from beyond the world, from higher than the world. Validation Goy Makrimalasha Yisrael. If a non Jew who is a who is a part of this world recognizes the greatness of a Jew to the point where he blesses you and says, may God bless you. Okay. That is an example. That is the, the starting of what we're trying to achieve, the unification of Havaya and Adnei, and a dwelling place for Hashem down in this world. So the, 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 the Talmud Yerushalmi says, if a non-Jew blesses you, say Amen. Meaning, if a non-Jew recognizes the greatness of the Jewish people, that's a sign that Amen is happening. What's Amen? The unification of Yud Kevavke and Adne. That the world is, is starting to sense the reality of God. If he uses his, uh, <coughs> his God, then you don't answer, of course. Uh, if he uses, I bless you with my God. Yeah, no. Well, no. Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> What do you say? No thanks. So, <laughs> maybe also the gods, if the yeah. gods should bless you. Too. So <laughs> this is uh, <laughs> going a bit. <laughs> so, so this is what this is saying is that the, the Jewish people, the, the the world's attitude to the Jewish people, is a symptom of the world's attitude to God. Um, and so you see that those nations who are trying to get rid of God out of the picture also have problems with the Jewish people, always. And, uh, and those nations who, who recognize God as being the source of reality recognize the power of the Jewish people. And, and so when the non-Jew blesses the Jew, 
that's a part of Zerub Zavtonim. That's a sign that things are going in the right direction. And and so you say Amen. The Yuki Vavke and Havaya and 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 Adne are coming together, which is Zerub Zavtonim, which is the whole point of creation. Okay. A little bit like the those seven day Atlantis. Yeah, like the, yeah, yeah there, are, there are many there are many nations now many who, who recognize the Jewish people's special role and want to help us so look at hey because the point of creation of man the reason why we're here is to create this home for Hashem in, the, in this lowly world and that is achieved through the way you serve Hashem. You have to serve Hashem in such a way that a non-Jew will recognize that that is a great thing, will respect it to the point where he'll bless you. Right. So in other words, this is not something, it's not up to the non-Jews to do this. It's up to us to live in such a way, to present such an example that the non-Jewish world will look at it and say, that's good, that, that we respect, we, we bless that. So since that's at the point of creation, it must mean that every Jew has the power to do this. If this is the purpose of creation, if this is what Hashem wants out of creation, that we should serve Hashem in such a way that the world will recognize its, 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 its power, it must be that we have the power to do that. Because Hashem doesn't give us a job that we can't fulfill. So it must mean that every Jew has the power to serve Hashem in a way that will be respected. And this must particularly be the case in the final generations preceding redemption. We have to just finish off the job of creating this home for Hashem. All the generations before us have accumulated their spiritual efforts to create the Dirim Tachtonim, the home for Hashem in this world. We, the last generation, just have to finish off the job. So it must mean that we have even more power to do that final step. It's not just like 99% has been done and we have to do the 1%. It's that all the work from the previous generations is like getting ready for what we need to do. We need to actually make it happen. So the biggest job is on the last generation, which is us, to, to actually make it happen. We've got the achievements of the previous generations behind us, but we have the biggest job to do, and that is to actually create, bring Hashem into the world finally and completely. So therefore, we must have extra powers, our generation, to do that, to achieve that. And so we could say that that's one of the reasons why the Friedrich Rebbe, the Rebbe's father-in-law, the Rebbe Rayatz, told the story, that there was a story that, that the Rebbe about the Rebbe Friedrich Rebbe said about the Rebbe Marash, who, that every day he used to go out for a little walk. Get some fresh air and go for a walk. And once, as he was going for his walk, he went on a different route, a detour. And there was a bunch of non-Jews who saw him walking down the street. And when they saw him, they all bowed down to him. They all just fell to the floor and bowed down to him. Right? And later when they asked the Rebbe Rash well, what was going on there, oh, no, he said, So the Rebbe Rash said, well, who else does it say about that you should be blessed by all the nations? Who else is it talking about? In other words, the, the, he, he was walking down the street, suddenly all these people bowing to him. So someone said, what's, so one of the Rebbe Rasha's Hasidim said, what's going on here? So Rebbe Rasha said, what are you surprised? It says that you should be blessed by all the nations. Well, are you surprised that they're bowing down to you? Like, is there something strange? That's, that's what the Torah says, that the nations should, should bless you, recognize you. So they're bowing down to him. Right here, the Rebbe Rasha had a, had a very holy, holy appearance, and when they saw him, they bowed to him. So this story was told, the Friedrich Rebbe told this story. Why, why did he tell this story? What's... What's the lesson from the story? The reason why the previous rabbi told this story 
and said that it should be publicized, this story. It, it could be that what the Friedrich Rebbe was trying to do was to trying to use this as an empowerment for all, every single Jew to achieve this level. The fact that the story happened itself is significant because it happened to the Nasi, the leader of the generation. The leader of the generation includes the souls of the entire generation. So if non-Jews bowed down to him, it's like bowing down to the entire Jewish people. And so it's, it's an illustration of this point that the nations recognize the holiness of the Jewish people. The fact that it didn't happen to anybody, it happened to the Reb Marash, who was the leader of the generation, is very significant. It's, it's a, it's a turn, turning point in, in history that that should happen. But the fact that another leader of the generation, who was the previous Rebbe, told the story, publicized it, it was in order to strengthen this idea in all of us. This doesn't mean that we're looking for non-Jews to bow down to us. Or that's, you know, that's the, what it means is that this story was a, a major significant story. That, that, I mean, this happened you know, back in Russia, that non-Jews should be bowing to a rabbi. Like recognizing the holiness, that was, that was an incredible thing. Since that time, it's much more common, and t today it's, it's very common for, for non-Jewish people to recognize the special place the Jewish people have in history and to praise them. The fact that it happened to a Nazi, a leader of the Jewish people, and then another leader told the story, was in order to strengthen this idea that this is what we're supposed to be doing. We should, we should represent such a holiness, such a, a sense of godly presence, that a non-Jew will see us and respect us. So it says much more about the Rebbe Rash than about the non-Jews. You know, it, it, it's that he was exuding such presence that anyone recognized this and had, had, to, be, had to be respectful to him. And that, that power we're all given. And the Rebbe is saying a fascinating idea here, something that's, that's quite unprecedented in a way, that, that, the, that our mission in this, these generations is to be such worthy representatives of God in the world that our neighbors should see that and, and give, it, give us dignity for that. So, so interestingly involved, the Rebbe now co connects this with, with the festival of Sukkot. So we could say that the power to do this, to, to represent God in the world to the point where the nations respect us, the power to do this is given to us from above, mainly on Sukkot. On Sukkot we are pumped with the energy to do this for all year. That through on Chagas Sukkot, on the festival of Sukkot, everybody knows, including the non-Jewish nations, that the Jewish people have won the court case, which we described earlier. Not only do they know about it, but they agree that the Jewish people have won, meaning the Jewish <coughs> people have this... this uh, the special, unique relationship with Hashem. And they even praise Hashem that He has been so kind to us, as we said earlier. That gives us the strength that for the entire year we should be able to live in such a way that all the nations bless us. This, what yeah. the court case again? <coughs> Medrash said that, that on Rosh Hashanah, there's a court case between the Jewish people and the nations of the world. Yeah. And on Sukkot, we come out with our lulav victorious that we won the court case. Well, what was the court case? So the court case was that is the greatness of the Jewish people going to be revealed or not? Are we, ju are we just another nation just like any other nation? Or even worse than every other nation? Or is our greatness going to be expressed? Mm. Um, the, the presence of Hashem in the world. So on Sukkot, we come out and say, we won. That not, not, not that we won against them, they but that, that, yeah, that, that they agree and they, they actually bless Hashem because Hashem is in the world through the Jewish people. So on Sukkot, this all, this all happens on a spiritual level. This is all happening. 
third last line. The Indian and Nitzach and Yisrael, Indian and Zechayu, who should menatz him esam managit. The idea of, of a victory, that the Jewish people are victorious, is that you're victorious over a, an opposition. To win means there's an opposition there. What this means is that if the Jewish people reveal on Sukkot their victory to the point where the non-Jewish people also agree and praise Hashem and are happy about it, what that means is that even those who originally opposed us, our enemies, actually are transformed into friends. Top of the next page. And they praise Hashem about the fact that Hashem has been good to us. So therefore, the, ble- the, the power given on Sukkot to be blessed by all the nations includes those nations that are our enemies because it says we should be blessed by Kol, all the nations, including those who oppose us. And so on Sukkot, we're given the power that we should live on such a level that our enemies should be transformed into friends. And this is a teaching to all, all, all Jews. <coughs> Even though there may be, at certain times, people who prevent your Avodah Hashem, who stand in your way, that should not, God forbid, weaken your serving Hashem in any way. And certainly, you should not be giving up or, or feeling it's hopeless. And when you decide to fulfill your, your, your mission without having any consideration to the blockages that are in your way, you will see clearly that all those blockages and, and uh, impediments have no reality whatsoever. On the contrary, the fact that you do have impediments and blockages is only to lift you to a higher level, to bring out your inner strength. That you should have the avoid of birurim, bringing the goodness out of the negative, and also the avoid of tests, that you're being tested in order to bring out inner strengths. Because if you wouldn't have any blockages, you would never have to put in the extra effort to bring out your deeper power. Because we daven, and, we, and we're told to daven, don't give me an assign, don't test me. We're not allowed to seek out tests. So if a test does come, it must be because Hashem wants us to go to a higher level. We're not looking for it. We don't seek it out. We, da- we daven in our davening, please don't test me. We, we, we don't want it. So when it does come, it's not what we want, it's what Hashem wants to bring out some deeper thing within us. We go to a higher level. And to the point where in the end, even those who try to block us will in the end become partners and help us. You'll be blessed by all the nations. And that is the true fulfillment of Hashem's intent to make a dwelling place in the lowest world, which means, what's the lowest? Those who oppose us, those who are against us, actually become partners. In the lowest possible place. So what's the, what's, what's the Rebbe talking about here? It seems, you know, you can have a guess. This, is, this was said in 1978, this, this mimer. So it's very likely what the, what the Rebbe here is talking about something going on in, in Soviet Russia. That's my guess. That, that there, there was a real opposition to Yiddishkeit. And the rebel was saying that, uh, that the way that that opposition is, is uh, conquered is by the Jewish people living a, a life in such a way that holiness is obvious. Even the non-Jewish nations who oppose us, eventually, they're not real oppositions, they will actually help us. And um, so this was... In, in those years, this would have been seen as an impossibility. That, that the Russians, you know, they were, they were completely opposing Yiddishkeit in any way, stopping Jews from fulfilling uh, their mission. And the rabbis, seen, uh, is my, my guess, is encouraging them that, that no, by, by you just standing firm, 
you'll see that they'll actually end up being help, they'll actually help you out. That's right. And so it was only 13 years later where it actually happened that, that the Russian government turned turned around. Um, Putin was uh, around. two weeks ago, or three weeks ago at the Kotel. Yeah. And he was making a statement that this is uh, the land of the Jews. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the exact words, but it was a very strong statement about yeah. the Jewish yeah. people's purpose. Yeah, so who would, who would, have, who would have dreamed this? Putin. Okay, so we'll stop there. Yeah.